My name is Joanna Bundes. Uh, this is some of my PhD work that I've done in Ashley Feather Club at the University of Toronto. So I guess like pretty much everyone in this room, I'm interested in studying speciation and for sexually producing organisms, speciation involves the evolution of reproductive cycles. And I've been focusing my research on studying intrinsic reproductive isolation. So when we see hybrid inviability and sterility, that's unrelated to the environmental context. And I think there are a few good reasons to study intrinsic reproductive isolation. One reason is that of all the different kinds of isolating barriers, it's the only one that when complete is completely irreversible. So you can't get from full complete sterility back to partial sterility, for example. Second, uh, we see the same patterns in many plant and animal taxa. So what this means is that potentially we can study um, intrinsic reproductive isolation and these patterns in one species pair and get general insights into the speciation process. So I'll just quickly go over a couple of the patterns that we often see in intrinsic reproductive isolation. The first is called mutual. So here what I'm showing is a female frog from one species mating with a male frog from a different species. And this female frog has two X chromosomes and the male has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, so it's the heterogeneous sex. And they might mate and produce some hybrid offspring, but what we tend to see is that when there is inviability or sterility or even absence, that tends to be in the heterogeneous sex. So in this case, we see male inviability. The second pattern is asymmetric postmigotic isolation. So here I'm staining the frogs, so female from one species and a male from a different species. And since there is partial reproductive isolation, we're seeing something like 20% hybrid viability. We could do this cross, but in the opposite direction. So the female from the species and the male from the species. And we often see that there's a difference in the reproductive in the strength of reproductive isolation. So in this case, we're seeing 80% hybrid viability. And I've actually been looking at these two patterns experimentally using senioritis nematodes. Uh, so here I'm showing just the elegance group of senioritis. There's actually about 50 known species. Uh, most of them, like C. latens and C. romanii, are male-female species. They're basically all found on rotting fruit, and they're found all over the world. Uh, so I've been looking at this pair, C. latens and C. romanii, and they are unique in the genus. There's only a couple of species pairs that are actually able to produce viable and fertile hybrid offspring, which we need to actually study them. So what we've shown in the lab is that when we cross these two species, we see both Haldane's and postbiotic um, reproductive, or sorry, um, asymmetric postbiotic isolation. So here what I'm showing is C. latens females crossed C. romanii males, and we get F1 females and F1 males. So what I'm showing is um, that this female has inherited half the autosomal genome from the mother, half the autosomal genome from the father, an X chromosome from each parent, and the mitochondria from the mother. And we can do this cross in the opposite direction. So C. romanii females cross to C. latent females. And one of the most striking things is that males in this direction of the cross are mostly fertile, while 95% of these males are sterile. And we've shown that the sterility is caused by developmental defects in the F1 males. So here at the top, I'm showing a pure species male uh, with a perfectly shaped gonad with a nice loop. And then these bottom four are different sterile F1 males that have completely deformed gonads. So they're not going to be transferring any sperm to the females. Whenever we see asymmetric postzygotic isolation, it's predicted that this is caused by some sort of interaction involving a uniparentally inherited element. So what that potentially means is that it could be an interaction between this Romania, this Romania mitochondria and the latent autosome, or the Romania X chromosome and the latent autosomal genome. And we know that mitonuclear incompatibilities are pretty important in speciation and in postbiotic reproductive isolation in general. Uh, a good example are tuberculosis copepods. And so we wanted to directly test whether mitonuclear incompatibilities cause this hybrid male sterility in this cross. 
And to do that, we used our pure species, so pure steelogens and pure steromonia. And by 20 generations of fat toxin, we created these mitochondrial replacement strains. So here, this is steelogens, the complete nuclear genome, but with steromonia and mitochondria. And this is steromonia, but with the steelogens. And we use these four different strains in crosses in all possible combinations. So along here are all the strains used as the maternal parent, and along here are all the strains used as the paternal parent. And so we'll fill in these boxes uh, with the hybrid males produced from each cross. So for example, this male has the autosomal genome 50% uh, from each parent, and the X chromosome and mitochondria from the mother. So we end up with these different males. And if uh, hybrid male sterility is caused by mitonuclear incompatibility between this blue Romania and mitochondria and the latent autosomal genome, then it's this set of males highlighted in red that we expect to be sterile, while these white males should be fertile. So we did all these different crosses, and what we actually found is that it was this set of males that were sterile, while this white set of males were fertile. <coughs> And so here's the genotype of the sterile males, and here's the genotypes of the fertile males. And so what we then thought is that it's more likely that it's uh, X autosome incompatibility because what these sterile males have in common is this Romania X chromosome. And so I tested this. What I did was I used a reciprocal F1 backpack design uh, replicated with different mitochondrial backgrounds. I don't have time to go into the details of this box, but basically what I ended up with were males that had different proportions of the X and autosomal chromosomes from each species. And we can predict the proportion of males that should be um, sterile or fertile depending on the genome that they the genome that they have. So what I'm showing first are the predictions along the y-axis as the proportion of males that we expect to be sterile and all the male genotypes along. So for example, for our F1s, um, this set of F1s has the latent X chromosome, and so we expect almost all of these males to be fertile. On the other hand, this set of F1 males has the Romania X chromosome, and so we're expecting 95% sterility. We have one class of males that due to recombination has a 50% chance of inheriting whatever locus is on the Romania portion of the X chromosome and so 50% of these males should be sterile. And we also have a class of males that, because of recombination on the X and on the autosome, have a 50% chance of inheriting the Romani X locus, and a 50% chance of inheriting the latent autosome locus, so 25% of these males should be sterile. And this is our actual data. And I think what is clear in a way is that 